Hi, I'm Ted Wolf, presented by Guidewise. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast, where we connect you to the stories and insights of people who have mastered implementation. Why? Because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Join us as we uncover the secrets of successful implementation so you can conquer your implementation struggles. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast, presented by Guidewise, where we focus on the topic of implementation for business leaders. As we believe ideas are easy, but implementation can be difficult. Today, our guest is Dr. Ellen Langer, coming back to our podcast for the second time. Dr. Langer was the first woman to be tenured at Harvard, where she still teaches, and she's known as the mother of mindfulness. Today, we're going to talk about her new book that's coming out, September 5th, The Mindful Body, Thinking Our Way to Chronic Health. Welcome, Dr. Langer. Hi, Ted. Thank you. Uh, the typical stereotype of a business leader is one who has the philosophy of work hard, play hard, and they're usually control freaks. So when they get sick, they go to a doctor. The doctor gives them usually a prescription drug. They take the drug and the doctor basically in the prescription drug takes over everything in their mindset. But you believe there's a different approach. You believe that um, we're more in control of our health than we think. So could you tell us a little bit about your research in that area? Sure, I'd be happy to. I'm not anti-medical world, but I think that uh, there are ways that we can bring about our own health um, that go far beyond what most people assume. Um, this book is about essentially mind-body unity. You know, that uh, mind, body, these are just words. If we put the two back together, then wherever we're putting the mind, we're necessarily putting the body. And so what we've done is put the mind in strange places over many years now with phenomenal results. And um, on a side point of this is that not only can we do a great deal of healing and preventive uh, prevention of illness, that every thought we have actually has an effect on our health. Let me give you an example of a couple of these mind-body unity studies. The very first one was the counterclockwise study. This has been reported elsewhere for some time now. In fact, I can even say it's a famous study, uh, which would be obnoxious, except that uh, the if you go to the Simpsons, the Simpsons go to Havana. They talk about the study. But if there's anybody who doesn't know it, essentially all we did was retrofit a retreat to 20 years earlier. And we had old men live there as if they were their younger selves. All right. So it's um, everything there is to put them back in the past. And for them, the past is the present. And this very simple thing in the short time of, I don't remember if it was five days or a week, but either one is very short, we found their vision improved, their hearing improved, their strength improved, their memory, and they look noticeably younger. And all, of course, without any medical intervention. So now let's go fast forward. Uh, let me go to one of the most recent studies, because this is kind of fun, it is a study on wound healing. And what we wanted to do was take a person who's got a wound to inflict a wound. Now, um, even if I wanted to hurt somebody badly, the review board wasn't going to let me do this. But what we did was use this Chinese cupping, which creates a wound. And so essentially, people have these wounds, and they're in front of a clock. For a third of the people, the clock is going twice as fast as real time. For a third of the people the clock is going half as fast as real time. And for a third, it's real time. So the question we're asking, is that wound going to heal based on their perception of time or real time? And obviously, I wouldn't be telling you this if we didn't find it's perceived time. We have people in a sleep lab. They wake up. We have fixed the clock so they think they got two hours more sleep, two hours less, or the amount of sleep they actually got. And once again, biological and cognitive functions follow perceived sleep, the perceived amount of sleep. Uh, so uh, I have so many of these studies that I'm reasonably sure, uh, only because certainty is mindless, otherwise I'd be certain <laughs> that mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. uh, if we put our minds in a healthy place, we will be healthy. 
So in the book, I'm fascinated, you talk about mindfulness, and I'd like you, if you could, just describe mindfulness briefly, but mindfulness is always connected with a mental state. Here you say, be mindful of your body. So mindfulness now incorporates not just your mind and your thoughts, but your body. Well, remember that I'm, I'm arguing that we're best off seeing mind-body as a single unit, All right? So that, again, every thought will affect your mind. But I'm, I'm glad you asked me to tell people, so what does she mean when she says mindfulness? Even though I've been studying this for over 45 years, there's still some confusion out there. Uh, it's so simple, Ted, that it almost defies belief when I tell you what it is and the findings that we've gotten over all these many years. All you need to do is notice new things. When you're actively noticing new things, so take something you think you know, notice new things about it, and you'll see you didn't know it as well as you thought you did. Then your mind naturally goes to it. Now, we've been taught, in fact, in business, when people are taught how to do their jobs, they're usually given a set of absolute directives, just as we're taught in school. You know, so, Ted, if I asked you a simple question, how much is one in one? Two. Two. No, not always. If you were to add one watt of chewing gum plus one watt of chewing gum, one plus one is one. One cloud plus one cloud, one plus one is one. One pile of laundry plus one pile of laundry. It goes on and on. So in the real world, one plus one doesn't equal two as or more often as it does. So what is the right answer? Well, it depends. And so you have to stay in the present in order to see what it depends on. What is the context? Lots of people say things like, be in the moment. And it's sweet, but it's an empty instruction. Because when you're not there, you're not there to know you're not there. Sadly, uh, across you know, all of these studies for so many years, we find that virtually all of us are not there most of the time. But being there, just active noticing, results in, as you're noticing, the neurons are firing. It feels good because this is what you do when you're engaged. Um, people see you and think you're more charismatic, trustworthy, authentic. Uh, the effect on the body is straightforward. We've been doing this for forever, studies we've already mentioned to you, that as you're mindfully engaged, noticing, the neurons are firing, and it's literally and figuratively enlivening. Not only that, so it's easy, it feels good, it's good for you, but we have studies that show that when you perform whatever you're doing, create whatever you're creating mindfully, it actually leaves its imprint on the product. So an example of a study we did a while ago, we have uh, symphony orchestras, and they're asked to remember a time that you played this piece um, and you enjoyed playing it, play it the same way replicate that performance versus make it new in very subtle ways that only you would know. Now, they're playing classical music, so it has to indeed be subtle, right? Otherwise, it would be not uh, good to the ear. Okay, We tape it. We play it for people who know nothing about the study. People overwhelmingly prefer playing, uh, excuse me, overwhelmingly prefer the mindfully played piece. And all of the um, members of the orchestra prefer playing it that way. So you're enjoying yourself while you're doing it. It's good for your health, which is going to be good for the company in, in 10 other ways, um, but that it's also going to yield a better product. Okay. So let's say an individual starts to feel ill. They go to a doctor, they get a prescription. The doctor tells them what their illness is, prescribes to them what he thinks need or she thinks needs to be done. So in effect, they take that person into a mindless state because they're not aware of their beliefs and their own thoughts. How do they redefine those rules for themselves so that they can get, take advantage of that health aspect? Well, first of all, um, I, I don't know if I should reveal this, but many of us um, are given prescriptions that are just placebos. And placebos, I think, are our strongest medicine. Now, if you think of it, if the placebo is inert, it's inactive by definition, um, and you get better, then what's making you better? You're making yourself better. So the question you're asking really is, so, so how can we do this and leave out the doctor and the medicine in the first place? And um, we have several studies that I report in um, the Mindful Body that deal with 
One, I call attention to symptom variability. And that sounds like a mouthful. It really is just being mindful. But essentially, when you have some ailment, and let's take the big ones, all right? You have chronic illnesses. Now, when people have a chronic illness, they understand that to mean there's nothing they can do about it. They typically assume the problem is going to stay the same or get worse. Interestingly, nothing goes in only one direction. There are times you feel a little better, times you feel a little worse, and so on. But we don't pay attention to those. So the first thing we did um, was to take people who are in chronic pain. We, we've done this now with um, multiple sclerosis, um, Parkinson's disease, chronic pain, stress, and many, many disorders, and it works for all of them. So I'm going to call you. You have whatever this, uh, your ailment is. And I'm going to say, how do you feel right now, Ted? And you're going to tell me. Um, and then I'm going to call you a little while later and say, how do you feel now? Is it better or worse than before? And why? And we do this periodically throughout the day, throughout the week. And three things happen with this. The first is you see, gee, you're not in pain in the same degree all of the time. So you tend to feel better. Second, by answering the question, trying to why now and not before, um, why now are you feeling a little better or worse? What's changed? You're being mindful. And as I've said, uh, that's going to be good for your health. And third, you're more likely to find a solution when you're looking for a solution. And so um, the question I was answering with this was, well, you can't give yourself a placebo. Uh, so how can you exercise the control that you're exercising when you think it's because of the drug? So everybody has a smartphone now. So set the smartphone to ring in an hour and ask yourself the question, how am I now? Is it better or worse than before and why? Then set it for three hours later, 15 minutes later, keep varying it. And as I said, across so many disorders, um, we found um, um, a great change, improvements. And this is also true for, let's say, stress. You know, there are people who think they're stressed all the time. Nobody is anything all the time. The problem is, as soon as you're not stressed, you're so excited about not being stressed, you're just living being, and you're not thinking about the stress. So you're stressed, thinking stress, then you're not thinking about anything related to that, then you're stressed again. It seems as if that intervening feeling fine didn't exist. But if, let's say, Ted, you're one of these people, you're stressed all the time, and we call you periodically in the way I just described, and how are you now? Are you more or less stressed than before? And why? You may find out that you're only stressed when you're talking to Ellen Langer. Well, if that's the case, then the cure is easy. Just don't talk to me. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> so, um, and this has been phenomenally effective, um, as I've said, across all disorders. And it's also important, you know, that we have a sense, no matter where we are in business, on the top or, or the bottom, um, we tend to hold still our views of other people. You know, you're always, you're an X, whatever that is. Uh, you, you're incompetent, you're unpleasant, whatever. Um, as if you always are. And the same rule applies. Nobody is always anything. And when you notice the moments that it's not true, your relationship to that person will improve. Let's say there's the, the idea that the, the body leads the mind and the mind leads the body. There's that interaction. Well, I'm saying, um, no, I, I'd rather not a... talk about it as an interaction because then you have okay. everybody talking about the mind-body connection. I'm saying it's one. It's okay. one unit. Okay. Where's the place for psychosomatic illnesses then? Well, you know, <laughs> this may be going out on a limb, but there is a way that I think all illness is essentially psychosomatic. It's not a bad thing. That means we have control over it. You know, that I'm saying that even with these big illnesses, um, that our minds can effectively reduce or eliminate the symptoms. Um, and I think another point that might be worth making now is that stress, in my view, stress is probably the major killer. There was research I was engaged in before COVID that we didn't get back to with people um, in China where essentially I wanted to take people who were just diagnosed with major 
major diseases, let's say cancer, different kinds of cancer. And nobody, I don't think, if they're told they have cancer, is going to not be stressed. So let's give them a little while. After two weeks, we come back. And then every month, we um, assess how stressed they are. The prediction is that that degree of stress will determine the course of the disease over and above everything else. And stress, people understand, is a psychological construct, right? Events aren't stressful. What's stressful are the views we take of the events. The more mindful we are, the more choices we have available to us as to how we're going to explain the event. Okay, so you talk in the book about mindful optimism and radical empathy. How's that tie into the mindset for a healthy body? There are people who think that the best way in, to be in this world is to expect the worst and hope for the best. And uh, this is a mindless strategy as far as I'm concerned, because you tend to get mm -hmm. what you expect. You know, that there are so many things that can be, uh, you can notice so many things, you're telling yourself, notice the negatives. It's also the case that no matter what you're saying, can be flipped around to be positive or negative. Now, for example, you may not like me, Ted, because I'm so gullible. Or you may really appreciate me because I'm so trusting. You get on my nerves because you're so inconsistent. Ah, you're one of the closest people to me because you're so um, flexible. Okay, so you, you know, um, I, I don't like you uh, because you... Uh, are so wishy-washy you can't seem to stay in one place, or I can appreciate you because you're so flexible. Every single negative ascription we have for ourselves or other people has an equally strong but oppositely val valenced alternative. And again, the more mindful we are, the more we can appreciate. So if you're looking for negatives, you're going to find them. If you're looking for positives, you're going to find them. And so I think that we don't want to start out saying, let's expect the worst um, and hope for the best because we're bringing about the worst, but rather just assume that um, there are multiple ways of seeing, fixing, doing whatever it is you have before you, and that um, there's always a solution that will yield something positive for you. So let's say the business person is under a lot of stress at work deadlines they have to meet, revenue, changes from COVID, whatever it be in the business environment. They're individuals who usually are pretty high-powered people, high-performing people, type A maybe, I'll say, and they're really into control. So being mindful, particularly with your health and your body, being mindful of your body, do you feel a certain thing like a cold is coming on or I have a, a hip that's hurting or something like that? You keep monitoring it over time. No, I'm not suggesting that we all spend our time now becoming hypochondriacs. You know, that if, mm -hmm. if we're living the way I'm suggesting we will, if we're being mindful, um, our, our bodies and minds will be cooperating. So there's nothing much to attend to. But certainly, if something is thrown off a little bit, you know, that if you're a, a mechanic and you start your car and the car goes, eh, you know, tiny bit, <laughs> you're going to be aware of it and you're going to fix it before whatever it is that caused that causes major damage. And it's the same thing with our bodies. So you don't have to, you're, you're sort of loosely uh, aware. And then if something is thrown off, um, then yes, you can catch it sooner. Also, you know, we have data um, that we're collecting right now. People, uh, let's say uh, you uh, break your arm or your leg, whatever we want you to break, and uh, you go to the doctor. The doctor will typically tell you it's going to take, let's say for argument's sake, um, four months for it to heal. Now, then you get fixed in your mind, even with that cold. You know, the cold is going to take five days to heal. Whatever it is, we can't know this. So in this study, we're simply taking the, the healing time that's the quickest and telling people, some people heal even as quickly as, and we're expecting then everybody's healing time is going to be better. Everybody has to understand that all medical science, which is the same as all science in general, only gives us probabilities. That means maybes. So when the doctor tells you anything, 
Um, it's a maybe. It's a, it's a good guess, but not necessarily the case. It means it's going to be true some of the time for some people and not necessarily for us and not necessarily right now. Okay, so all this data is coming in um, in a business environment with my feeling stress. How do you make a decision in that environment? All yeah, these well, options you have, all these alternatives yeah. you're thinking of, how do you make a decision? Okay, so this is, this is a little complicated, but I'm glad you asked me because it's very important. And it goes against mm -hmm. almost everything that um, uh, people follow in the business world or in life in general. All right. Decision making uh, is largely an illusion. Um, if we if we start off and we say outcomes are neither positive nor negative, it's our minds that make them positive or negative. So if you and I, Ted, were going to go out to lunch and the food is great, wonderful. If you and I are going out to lunch and the food is awful, for me, great. I'll eat less, which will be better for my waistline. All right. So. Uh, the world doesn't determine how we experience it. We determine, if we're mindful, how we're going to experience it. Now, if it's the case that every positive is a negative and every negative is a positive, then you can't add up costs and benefits to tell you what to do because it's going to end up zero. It's also the case that despite what people think, prediction is an illusion. We can't predict. Let me tell you a funny story. I'm teaching a, a graduate course at Harvard on decision making. And I say to the students, there are about 12 in the class, and I say, okay, I have been teaching a version of this course for 40 years. I have never missed a class. What is the likelihood that I'm going to be here next week? So now we go around the room, and remember, these are Harvard students, so they give bizarre answers, 97%, as if, 98%, as if they can do some calculation. But essentially, each and every one says, I will be there. Now I say, I want to go around the room, and I want each of you to give me a good reason why I won't be there. And the first person always says, you've always been here, you deserve the time off. The next one says you have to take the dog to the vet. The next one says you get a flat tire. They go around the room, we have 12 good reasons why I might not be there. And now I say, okay, what is the likelihood I'm going to be, be there? And their 100% now drops to 50%. Okay, so when we realize that all decision making is about making a prediction, and we can't make predictions with any, uh, with any great confidence, then I think that puts us in a, a place that's actually much less stressful and um, uh, will have strong advantages, which is rather than try to make the right decision, make the decision right. And that's a lot easier. So I'm, I make a decision that the doctor's telling me, you know, unfortunately, I have cancer as an example. I have to make a decision. What do I do next? Where do I go? Who do I listen to? How do I make my decision the right decision, more useful decision? Um, yeah, I mean, we vary in that, you know, so that if you know 10 people who went to uh, Dr. X and are now cancer free, I think you'd be inclined to go to Dr. X and do whatever Dr. X says. Um, if you sample more broadly, you'll have more choice. I think that what we need to realize is that first, they can't be sure that you actually have cancer. You know, when, when you do a, a biopsy and you send the tissue down to the cytologist, and the cytologist is looking through that microscope and trying to figure out how many cancer cells there are. Um, these cancer cells don't come labeled. Hi, I'm a cancer cell, I'm not, so they can do a count. All right, so there's going to be some disagreement. Um, there's going to be some uncertainty and that not only that, but all of the measures taken, even if they were reliable, again, are not perfect predictors. Mm -hmm. right. um, let, me, um, let me cut to the chase in, in a certain sense mm -hmm. here. Um, mm -hmm. I got into a lot of this work because of what happened with my mother. Many years ago, my mother had uh, breast cancer, and the cancer had metastasized to her pancreas. Now, uh, that's the end game, right? Pancreatic cancer. 
And then magically it was just gone. It was totally gone. Now, the doctors were surprised because they already were not giving, uh, exercising her limbs or anything because they had written her off. So even though now she was perfectly healthy, cancer free, she had to leave the hospital in a wheelchair because of their presumptions uh, that um, she was not going to make it. All right. Now, we don't know how many people in the world at large have cancer and the cancer goes away by itself, right? Not everybody runs to the, the doctor. Not everybody can. Not every hospital or places in, you know, uh, some godforsaken places in the country where there is very little medical care. So these numbers may be big or maybe not. We just don't know. So when you're given the diagnosis, the first thing is uh, that I would do is not be so sure that I have it and what the it is, not be so sure that anybody knows what it is. And I would go about doing the things that I'm suggesting now, the attention to symptom variability. I would be living well for two re reasons. One, if my mind is is strong and living well, that's going to affect my body. And two, if the diagnosis is even worse than they assume, and let's say I only have a month to live, how do I want to live that month? You know, to being depressed, scared, I, I'd like to live it fully. And, and doing so is actually good for my health. So I think it sounds to me from the readings I've done with you, you gave a brief description or an outline there of an example of level one, two, three thinking. Yeah. So if I am and I realize I have some type of a problem that needs to be treated, could you run me through quickly what level one, two, three thinking and how to look at that, that circumstance? Sure. Um, now, um, the level one, two, and three um, is essentially level one, uh, you don't know. Level two, you think you know. Level three, you realize you really don't know because we can't know. Everything is always changing. Everything looks different from different perspectives. So the, the only thing we should be sure of is that uncertainty is ubiquitous. And all of mindfulness is exploiting the power in uncertainty. And that's all I'm saying with all this work on health, that we don't know that all sorts of things are possible if we, if we only look and um, uh, attempt to solve problems that others have overlooked. Um, this can play out in many ways. I'm diagnosed with cancer. Okay, level one is I don't believe it. Level two is I believe it and then give in to it. And level three is a different kind of not believing it. It's a more sophisticated, it's knowing that there's too much that's unknown to be sure. So I'm going to not so much pay attention to what people say, but pay attention to my body. Um, it's also the case that with anything, any part of us that's not working, other parts of us are. You know, that for lots of diseases that people think are uncontrollable, l let's imagine that um, you have some uncontrollable disease, whatever it is, and what you're going to do is stay in bed and uh, eat ice cream and watch uh, some television every day. That's all you're doing. Versus you're an Olympic athlete, and you're both given the same diagnosis to my mind, the Olympic athlete is the most likely to uh, to emerge victorious in the situation. You know that um, diagnoses are for parts of our body, and if we make sure the other parts of our body are strong, we're then helping that part that um, is uh, more vulnerable. I, I'm aware that you ask us what may seem to be a simple question. Okay, um, Ellen Langer, you're, you're the big shot here. Um, I'm given a diagnosis. What should I do? And um, there, there is no straightforward answer. But what you should do is um, not give up because of the understanding that those medical, the medical data are probabilities, not absolutes. So it may be true, it may not. 
and that should give you some reason to go forward. Um, you should be paying attention to the way your body feels and in that attention to variability method um, to become stronger. And if you recognize that um, nobody knows how long we have and you stay mindfully engaged, the neurons are firing and that is good for your health. So when people take a diagnosis and then turn off, you know, this is what is, that's all there is to it, um, then they're becoming less mindful and the system will in fact reflect that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay. Um, you mention in your book also that mind unity is not mind or mind-body equality. What would the difference, what would somebody think when they think mind-body equality versus unity yeah you can you can see mind and body you know in in some sense you have a wrist and you have a forearm um it's all part of your arm it's all part of you and in, in the same way we can talk about uh the mind but it's not separate it's every thought you have is going to reflect itself in some way in your body. There was some data I came upon many years ago, and I, I don't know who did this study, but it was remarkable, um, which is that tears of joy are biochemically different from tears of sadness. And, and that's what I mean by every thought affecting our body. So the whole key then is, to me, good health starts with a healthy mindset being aware of things that you're learning every day and every moment and basically every second that you're just aware and finding something new and different, not falling into that mindless set of, I know my experience tells me this, I'm certain about this, but the magic of uncertainty needs to be, needs to replace that. Yes. So once um, we, once we have a healthier respect for uncertainty, we can exploit the power in uncertainty, which is enormous, especially in today's world, while most people are certain, mindless certainty. And so they're oblivious to um, advantages that are right in front of them. They're oblivious to ways to avert the danger not yet arisen. And when you're there, and you're going to be there, uh, as soon as you know, you don't know. Now, not knowing makes some people nervous, especially in a business context, right? You know, that you're talking to your boss and um, you're uh, asked a question and you don't know the answer, uh, but you think you should know. And so you pretend, you lie, you avoid the, the situation in the first place. That's because you're making a personal attribution for not knowing. I don't know, but you know it's knowable. I'm trying to free everybody from that and make instead a universal attribution for uncertainty. I don't know. You don't know. Nobody knows. You can't know. You know, just think of the, the last several elections. I mean, who would have thought uh, that uh, Barack Obama would be elected? Then who would have thought that Donald Trump would be elected? So on and so forth. Or, or the stock market. You know, if people said to themselves, gee, what are all the things I was wrong about yesterday? would help them possibly be more uncertain going forward today. But that uncertainty is a gift. It means that all of the things you want to accomplish, uh, you may be able to accomplish. We can never prove that you can't, whatever it is, can't solve the problem, can't make all that money, can't get rid of that disease. We can't prove that. All we can prove is that the way you might have tried failed. All right. And all we know is that um, and another part of all of this in the business world, which is, I think is interesting, is most of what happens is a people game. And that when we're aware that it's a people game, um, I, I think that everything plays out in um, not only a healthier, but a more successful fashion. And all of your relationships um, improve. Again, you know, that if uh, I don't like you because you're um, so stubborn, and then I realize that's because you're stable, you know, as we've said before, then uh, our relationship 
is better, if our relationship is better and everybody in the business is happy, we're going to be working more effectively. Now, if we're all happy and supporting each other and being mindful, um, fewer, there are fewer days we're going to miss work. And if we miss work, there are going to be fewer illnesses or less serious illnesses that the company is going to have to pay for. Um, it's, it's just a different model. Um, and if we recognize that we don't know, that means the lowly person in the company may serve a different purpose than the person does now. You know, uh, I sit on top. You do too, Ted. A lot of us, you know, we're the big shots and everybody else is subordinate to us. Um, and you know what you don't know. I certainly know that there's lots that I don't know. Um, and if we recognize that everybody doesn't know something, but everybody knows something else, then we would draw from those people who now we're not paying a whole lot of attention to. As, you're, as the manager of your company and you're telling people how to do things uh, as if you know that that's the right answer. And I'll tell you, people say to me, is there ever a time to be mindless? And I say, only if two circumstances are met. First, you found the very best way of doing something. And second, if nothing changes, which of course, neither of those are going to be accepted. If you're going to do it, you're better off being there. And if you're being there, that means you've got a modicum of uncertainty. And that is very appealing. Um, that makes it so people find you more attractive. You actually find them more attractive. And we have data about how mindfulness is actually contagious. So if we have the people who are leading the organizations being more mindful, at some point, the whole organization should flourish. Yes, yes. So um, beliefs, emotions, and meanings that we assign to things are very key, obviously, in the entire development of our mindset. Being mindful means we don't know all the answers, so we're constantly exploring, searching for new things. And you've brought into the element now health and how to create a mindful set mindset of health in ourself and very, very well described in your book. And I, again, want to mention the mindful body. It's coming out on September the 5th and um, highly recommend reading it. Some unbelievably good nuggets of information, research and insight from yourself. And uh, I want to thank you for being here. Um, is there Anything else that you would want to add right now where an individual can go to learn more other than reading the book or take advantage of some of your insights um, that they can apply and how to implement them into their life and into their business? Um, I, I think that the bottom line to all of this is um, that we want to um, start to exploit the power and uncertainty. That will keep us mindful. And as we're doing that, actively noticing new things to keep our mind active, it also uh, is the best thing we can do for our bodies. And rather than make the mistake and thinking that what we need to do is have a mindless confidence that rests on certainty, I suggest the best way we need to be going forward is to be confident but uncertain. Because we don't know, nobody knows, which makes everything very exciting. Everything you think you can't do, you don't know you can't do it. Any disorder that you have um, can be um, uh, helped in numerous different ways. Every time a, you know, a physician says, this will take you I don't know, three weeks to heal. That means three weeks of company time where you're not doing those things you think you should be doing. All of that is based on maybes rather than absolute facts. Dr. Langer, if I can make one last comment, I picture you in my mind as an individual, and this is a label that I give myself as a being tamed fearless. You've, you've, your entire life have going into areas that were questionable, highly uncertain. You have had some experiments. I will say that 
appear to be a little outside of the box, but for instance, the, uh, the whole experiment that you, you did in your counterclockwise studies and things like that. So I think this is another contribution in the area of health. Business leaders all need good health, high energy so that they can continue through the day, but employees need the exact same thing. So I would suggest in my own mind, I look at this as using you as a model. You are tamed, but fearless going into areas that need to be explored to keep yourself mindful and awake and operate at the highest possible level that you can of performance. So let let me tell you something, Ted, let let me tell you that, you know, that while I know that I can appear fearless, um, (laughs) it's not that I see uh, negative things and say, who cares? I can forge my way through them. I don't see them in the first place. You know, um, and that's what happens when you start to realize that your emotions are choices. You know, your emotions are going to depend on the way you see a situation. If you see it as fearful, you're going to be afraid. Um, Once you recognize that um, anything can be understood, good, bad, or indifferent, why choose to see it in negative terms? And so, and, and oftentimes when you talk about, um, my being fearless, it's, so it's not, I don't recognize the negative in the first place. Sometimes it's my uh, naivete. And so these things have worked together to make it. So I keep asking people, how do you know who says so? Um, recognizing that everything depends on so many things. We have so much control, not just over our health, over our happiness. Those aren't separate. We have control over um, uh, the way we organize our lives and that everything that exists, everything is potentially mutable. We can change it if it doesn't work, but we're not going to change it unless we recognize that there are alternative ways it can be. Mm -hmm. So I'll change my label, if you will, from tamed fearless to Dr. Ellen Wanger just is. (laughs) Okay, I like that. (laughs) Thank you. Are you an implementer who wants to share your stories and insights on our podcast? If so, reach out to us at studio at implementors.io. Hi, Ted Wolf here. I want to thank you for joining us for this Implementers video. The Implementers podcast is presented by Guidewise, where we, along with our vetted member community, recognize that ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. To learn more about getting things done with Guidewise, please visit us at guidewise.io. And to conquer your implementation struggles, please like and share this video and subscribe to our channel. Happy implementing.